on you are as excited as Michelle told me to be. Uh, my name is Nick Sillings. I'm a customer success manager for Microsoft, so part of the crew here in Minneapolis. And what I'd like to talk about today is just to give you an update on the state of events in Microsoft Teams. And we need something really specific by that. Uh, most of the time in Microsoft Teams, you're doing calls or small collaborative meetings, but there's a special use case where I'm doing something that I'm almost like a consumption experience for all the attendees. I'm training, I'm communicating, they might be internal or external, but something tends to happen once you're over about anywhere from 20 to 30 people where it starts to require more structure and more control over the experience that we're doing. We also have some things that are coming out with Microsoft Teams Premium that I want to call out, and I am not trying to sell you Teams Premium uh, today. I, I mean, certainly everyone should buy it. Why, since I've started using it, I've lost weight. My marriage has improved. People from high school have reached out to ask how I'm doing. Uh, results may vary. But there's some really nice things that Teams Premium gives me as an event organizer. I just want to call out and some things you can do even without it with a basic Microsoft Teams that I want to sort of just kind of reemphasize uh, as we go through. So my focus for today, just kind of keeping an eye on time, I actually want to start with a, a just a kind of quick summary on where we're at, uh, the current offerings in Microsoft Teams that are coming out, uh, the ones that we have today. And so I want to do a quick recap of just where we're at in Teams meetings and how Teams Premium affects that. We'll take a look at webinars in Microsoft Teams. And between us, since we're in the Tree of Trust, um, I don't like how Microsoft markets our webinar um, engine because we talk about it as meetings and webinars, like it's a separate thing. A webinar is a Microsoft Teams meeting with registration. That's really the, the main difference. Otherwise, it's, it's a meeting. All the connection up to the service, all the controls that, the, that I have, the things that I can do inside of it, the types of content that I can share. Uh, so rather than seeing an invite as a calendar invitation, a webinar creates a registration page, and then people go to the page, sign up, they get an invite to the webinar, and Teams Premium does give me a few more capabilities I can do with the, that invitation and the registration process. I'm not going to spend too much time on live events. Uh, so Microsoft Teams live events have been out for about five years. Uh, they were originally a replacement for Skype broadcast, and they still work very similarly today. There's two types that I can do. One is I use Microsoft Teams as my content producer, uh, the Teams client. And so I have someone sitting on a Windows computer running Microsoft Teams. We have a live event scheduled. They pick what is on the screen and send it out, and it goes up across across Azure Media Services, possibly across the content delivery network and down to viewers, and they watch a media stream. That is not changing. So we're not taking anything away from Microsoft Teams live events. We're also not adding anything to it. So we're, we're continuing to support it, but we're not going to see any additional features come into Teams produced live events. And I'm being very specific with my words there, uh, but I'll still have that kind of very basic, uh, simple way to do a large scale event. We introduced earlier this year Teams Encoder live events, that third bullet underneath my third agenda item. This allows me, I schedule it inside of Microsoft Teams. And I use an external encoder, so another piece of software or hardware, and it's upstream, maybe it's running my studio production environment, or maybe I'm a professional streamer and I've got OBS Studio or some other app, and it's pushing the content into my live event all the way across out to my viewers. I don't use Teams for anything other than just scheduling it. So it's just kind of generating uh, the article inside of my Exchange Online mailbox. And that replaces the stream encoder live events. So you heard Don reference earlier, the stream is going away. What that means is stream classic, our original Microsoft stream, which was the evolution of Office 365 video years ago. Uh, we're retiring that. It's gonna be completely turned off next February. And as of this coming September 15th, you'll no longer be able to create a live event inside a Microsoft stream. That's okay. We've got a plan. You can still create live events with Teams. You can create live events with Teams and Coder. There, you'll get a HTML embed code that you can use if you do that. So I can drop it into a SharePoint web part as Kim just showed us. So I'll have a way to build kind of a landing page for an all hands or something external, just like uh, I've been able, well, I can't do external, um, just like I've done today with Microsoft Stream. And I can even do a public live event using uh, Teams encoder as well. So I'm going to step through all those and then finally wrap up with some really nerdy stuff in custom production. So everything I just covered um, is 
things that a mortal can do using Microsoft Teams. But we often get this question, and many of you are in this position, hey, we've got a production studio. Like we have people in the organization who like they've got nice cameras and some big desk full of uh, a switcher that controls things. They wear black all the time and the trunk of their car is full of HDMI cables. What can they use uh, to bring their skill set into this? And that's what we call custom production, where I can take that content from a studio environment and either push it into Microsoft Teams. So I'm not going to use my webcam or my screen share at all. I'm just going to use whatever fancy thousands of dollar gear they have upstream or I can stream from a Microsoft Teams meeting. And so I can stream out to um, Workplace by Meta or YouTube Live or Twitch or Facebook Live, just about any place that can take an RTMP source. That gets really interesting for public events because I could produce everything in a Microsoft Teams meeting and just send that out. Finally, if I'm using something called NDI or a device that supports a network device interface, I can extract the media content from a Teams meeting and then bring it into my encoder and arrange it and make it look really fancy. So that's my that's my um, uh, third option there on, on what I can do. So that's, that's our current state. So if you have to leave early, that's where we're at. I've got Teams live events. Those are not going away. Uh, if we ever do remove them, it will give plenty of knowledge, like a year or more, if we make any change to that. I've got my Teams encoder live events. That's what I can use if I've got an upstream professional environment to push out. But I'm going to recommend for most big events, a Teams meeting is actually enough. A Teams meeting with the right options set allows me to have up to a thousand people inside of a meeting. I can really lock it down so it's very similar to a, a one-way experience so people can't do things that are disruptive. And it's the easiest thing for just a regular user to go out and produce because it's what they're used to doing anyway. Um, so we'll, we'll, uh, I'll show a couple of resources we have to kind of kind of walk through that. And then finally, um, I've got the ability to RTMP out. Uh, under Teams Premium, I can also RTMP in. And in regular Teams, I can use NDI to extract media. And if you don't know those acronyms I just said, don't worry about it. Um, you are immortal, perfectly fine. Every one of those things that we add in uh, adds a little bit of complexity. If I was an IT admin supporting Microsoft Teams, I would push my users to use Teams meetings for everything and go into meetings options and lock down some of the settings. And then if that's not enough, then I would talk about live events and some of these other things. So after today, I would encourage you, hey, start with Teams meetings out of the box. It's kind of the simplest, simplest place to go. Okay, I'm going to pause for breath as I go. If you have questions, drop them into the chat. I made a note to never follow Don and his admin center updates again. And you catch he was tossing off earlier. Oh, yeah, Nick will cover that. Nick will cover that. So I've been frantically uh, going through documentation uh, for the last hour. Uh, we'll see how much we, we actually picked up. Let's see. I think... Uh, <laughs> I think uh, I, I kind of referenced, we got this concept of these um, events in Teams, and the way I always, if this comes up from a user perspective, this is how I talk about it to them, is most of your activity in Microsoft Teams is going to be regular meetings and calls, just one-on-one. -on -one. You may also have group meetings and formal meetings where we're all at parity. Right, we're all kind of equals, we're peers, we're all probably presenters. Uh, if, if somebody disrupts it, that's okay. It's probably a meeting of 10 to 20 people at the most. And then events, uh, there's there's no hard definition for this, but there are several different use cases. Uh, for me, I start to think of something as an event when it's got about 30 people. And I, I know that seems a little low, but at that point, I start thinking about, okay, that's Every extra person increases the chance of a, darking, a barking dog or some type of disruption. Uh, do I want to start limiting who can present? Uh, do I want to start maybe using polls instead of chat as we grow higher and higher? So town halls or all hands meetings, those are internal where I'm doing a division or company all hands with the CEO. She's got a strategy to share. We're trying to do organizational alignment. That complements tools like Viva Connections or Viva Amplify by giving me a live experience that goes alongside that. Webinars, which I mentioned earlier, are events with registration. That tends to be the biggest part of them as they're part of a longer process to bring in prospects or to do training or validate that people actually came to the event. And so we have to have a way to register and track who was there without opening a help desk ticket and asking some poor Teams admin uh, to go in the admin center and pull the media logs for the meeting. 
A broadcast event is way out on the edge. We tend to be using Teams as an endpoint to some other production system at that, at that point. And one thing we do not have a solution for in, built in to the Microsoft stack is any kind of a conference. So with Teams meetings and Teams webinars, they're all scheduled by individual users. I go in and I schedule one. Maybe I'm using a system account to do it, but I don't have a way to say upload a spreadsheet full of times and dates and generate a bunch of meetings or webinars from that. And so where that tends to fall a little bit short is someone that's running a multi day virtual conference. They've got many, many tracks and breakout sessions. Um, you'll notice like within the, the Minnesota Microsoft 365 user group, uh, they tend to use Sessionize or Eventify to kind of manage some of that experience and just drop the meeting join link uh, into those tools where normally the room location would be if we were in a conference center. Um, we use uh, events uh, internally at Microsoft for some of our things. We've got some custom apps. We use a lot of Microsoft 365 dynamics, but I do find if I'm doing a lot of scheduling of these things at scale, it makes sense to invest in a third party partner, one of Microsoft's partners that can use the graph API to manage the scheduling of all the events, just so you're not hopping in and out of somebody's calendar, making updates for something like a big conference. So that fourth pillar is one of the things we think of as an event, and if you are doing that or doing that at scale, that's something that I'm going to need to um, use another tool to complement Teams as the media delivery mechanism for it. So I'm going to pause uh, after this. I've got my large structured meeting. I can use options to control it. Inside of Microsoft Teams, if I have Teams Premium, I get a couple other things with that, and we're going to step out and demo these in a second. Uh, I can create meeting templates which allow me to have all those options pre-configured so a user can pick a meeting template. We can name it something like all hands and it's got things like who can present or attendee microphones already controlled or muted. Themes that allows me to customize the color of the lobby and the buttons that are inside of Microsoft Teams so they can match branding. Um, if you work with marketing people, you know how passionate they are about their Pantones and Hextones. Uh, it's not blue, it is our company's color of blue and you know, we, we hired a consultant for six months to help us figure that out. There's a new feature, Green Room, uh, a virtual green room that allows the presenters to talk, uh, to share content, to see each other on webcam before a meeting starts. And so you can bring attendees into a meeting. They sit in the lobby. They see something that says the meeting's about to start. Then I can hit start with a meeting. It's very similar to the way the start with the live events works. I'll show you what that looks like. And then finally, a great feature that lets you control who's on screen and what they're doing. Gives me a very simple producer-like view uh, to, to what we saw. These meeting options, while they're schedulable inside of the meeting options page in Teams, you can also click on the little three dots in Teams meeting, go under settings, bring the options up and make adjustments in real time. And Michelle just commented, hey, that's something I had to do once we got started, you know, realized I had to go in and adjust who can present. So it gives me a lot of control over the meeting experience while still letting it be a Teams meeting. Uh, webinars work the way they have for the last two years, but in Teams Premium, there's some additional capabilities with the registration piece. So when someone registers for a webinar with Teams Premium, you can turn on a wait list. So I can say, hey, I'm going to have um, spots for 200 people, but then you can wait list over that. Uh, you can also approve registrations so people can register, but until I go in and click approve, that attendee does not get the calendar invite to actually join the webinar. And Don alluded to this, you can also set up automatic reminders. So without Teams Premium, you get one invite to the webinar. With Teams Premium, you can go in and send out email reminders a week ahead of time, a day ahead of time, an hour ahead of time, saying, hey, Nick, reminder, you've registered, and here's the link for the webinar at one o'clock. Uh, the live events I kind of referenced, uh, really nothing changes, but I do want to call out one thing that is included with Teams Premium that is, is just an FYI. Microsoft does have a first party um, ECDN or Enterprise Content Delivery Network, and that allows us to mitigate network saturation when I've got a lot of people that are watching a stream, a media stream like a live event on the same network. Uh, this became an issue once the pandemic kind of got toward the end we started going back to work um, and we had people like showing up in buildings and saturating their network switch. So we do include an ECD and offering inside of Teams Premium. Uh, there's also third party ones available like from Ramp, Hive, Collective and other, other Microsoft and partners. 
My Teams Encoder live event, I kind of talked about that already. I can uh, push my professional content all the way through. I can stream a Teams meeting to a third party. There's two tools that allow me to do that. They're both apps in Teams meeting. One is called Custom Streaming. Uh, it's Microsoft's first party. We didn't spend a lot of time on how we made it uh, or how we named it. Um, the other is one that's specific to Workplace from Meta. Uh, so if you use Facebook for work, you can stream and it'll render inside of, um, of their tool with the content coming from, from Teams. And then finally, custom production. So for the rest of the time, I'm going to step through all these. Uh, I'm not going to cover any of our collaboration features, uh, virtual appointments, intelligent recap and Teams premium, end-to-end -end encryption, sensitivity labels, uh, scheduling things at scale, or anything else that Don drops into chat uh, over the next 30 or 40 minutes. That's what we're going to go through. All right. Don, Michelle, comments or questions? I'm going to dive into demos now. We're going to start playing with some stuff. All I'm going to say is ha, ha, ha. <laughs> oh, and Renee has a good point. Like, it, it's possible people were acts were you know deliberately or being in bad faith and muting people as they were talking. I suspect it's a lot more likely people were doing it accidentally. Um, and that's something that I've noticed myself. Sometimes I do. I'll you know kind of hit that control and space bar. What some of these options allow me to do is kind of prevent even anything from, from an accidental perspective uh, dropping over the top of it. So let's go look at a couple of things and let's start with those meeting options. Oh, wait, wait, hold on, Nick, go to the right slide. I was having so much fun with the um, cameo feature we saw earlier, and I'll show you what that is in a second and, and how it works. So um, what I'm doing right now, I'm, I'm going to do a screen share because I'm going to jump back and forth between. Um, these slides and a demonstration, but we will post these slides after. And you are welcome. They're my slides. I created them. They're not copyright written. Um, you are welcome to steal them and use them for end user training. What I've tried to do is on every one where there's features or capabilities is down here at the bottom is a link to the help article for it. So like here, if I click on this one about scheduling a large meeting and having a um, co-organizer, that will take me right out, if I drag my browser over, right out to the help article on support.microsoft.com on how to have a co-organizer when you schedule a meeting, a good best practice uh, to make sure I've got other people kind of helping me um, manage meeting options and, and meeting settings. So with a large meeting, a couple that I want to call out that I like to do, the first is, as I just referenced, is set a co-organizer. And what that means is the meeting lives in your Exchange Online mailbox. Only you, the person who originally scheduled it, can change the start time of the meeting. But every other setting can be adjusted by a co-organizer. Michelle went in earlier and adjusted who could present to make sure she sort of pulled back some of those permissions, including the mute all attendees, which we were or accident or mute all, which we were accidentally clicking on. And when I'm doing a large meeting. I like to go in and turn off the mic and the camera for attendees. You can always right click on someone and turn those back on. A nice way to do that is wait for people to raise their hand and then right click, unmute, or let them know, hey, you can now come off mute and they can ask a question and we, we can all hear it. The other one down here at the bottom is meeting chat. You can actually go in and turn that off so people can't use the chat in the meeting. And the place that I do that is if I'm using Q&A. Uh, the built-in Q&A app for meetings. The reason is they both show up on the uh, right-hand side of the screen or as a pop-up if they're on mobile, and it confuses the heck out of users if they've got both a chat and a Q&A pane, a moderated Q&A that they can use at the same time. They're not quite sure where to put their question in. So once I get to a bigger meeting, say about 50 people or so, maybe even 100, I'll start thinking about turning off the chat, just enabling Q&A, and then moderating that Q&A. Maybe have a friend who's also a presenter in the presenter role to kind of help me go through it and set it up. So those are all listed here, the links there. And then, as I mentioned, what Michelle did, since this meeting was already underway, I suspect she just went to the three dots, settings, and meeting options. You can even adjust all these things on the fly. Um, that's nice if you have a meeting where part of it's interactive and part of it isn't. Maybe I'm doing an all hands with 900 people. Our executive is talking. Uh, now she's done and we want to take questions, so I'll come in and enable chat or enable reactions, but I don't want to do that while the person is doing the one-way part of the, uh, of the session. The way this looks for attendees is if we go in and disable microphone or camera, there's just a little pop up at the top of the meeting that says your mic or camera has been disabled and they can dismiss that and, and then keep working. 
I think we're all familiar with Ray's hand. I just want to call out the thing, two things I love about it. It shows the order that people's clicked on raised hand if you go to the people pane, so you don't have to decide who's next. Uh, I love this because years and years ago, I worked in a retail store, and if people sometimes mill around the cash register, and you never want to like say, okay, I'll take you next, because what if you're wrong? Everybody gets all upset. So you'll notice next time you're in a store, a really good cashier will say, can I take who's next? And they let the people sort it out. They're trying to defer that off. Here, I'm letting teams do it. Uh, sorry, Danielle, uh, Charlotte raised her hand first. She gets to go and then I can right click, unmute her. And then uh, if we're at the end of a Q&A session, you can also click up at the top and choose lower all hands. That's a nice way of like, hey, we're out of time now, we've got to move on and, and we have to keep going. The managed Q&A that's now built into Teams allows people to post questions and then we can publish an answer we can answer in private or we can dismiss it so it gives me a very nice moderated way if i'm concerned someone may uh, post something inappropriate or i just want to have control uh, just for time that gives me a nice capability and allows me to do it on this slide i included one other link and it's all the way down here at the bottom where it says admin manage q a it just shows where you have to go to turn on and enable the Q&A app inside of Microsoft Teams in the tenant. Um, we use the Yammer engine under the covers for Q&A. You don't have to have Yammer turned on or uh, being using a, a Yammer network, but you do have to have the endpoints to get to Yammer enabled in your tenant, just because that's what we're making the call back and forth from inside of Microsoft Teams. But I don't need any other, any other community or anything else uh, stood up inside of Yammer. Um, Spotlight is the same feature that I've had for a while. Same thing with presenter mode where I can go in and drop people over the top of content. But what you saw me use earlier was Cameo with PowerPoint Live. I love this. And when I said earlier, hey, we want to encourage users, um, just, oh my gosh, Tamara, uh, Don, will you take that one? I always get mixed up on a GCC, GC High, CC High, and DOD um, on her question on where we're currently at. Tamara, it's probably coming. Anything we say, just add like two years, it's probably going to show up in that tenant. Uh, but let's check. Uh, we'll check that while we're talking. Um, with PowerPoint Live and Cameo, uh, the way this works, so PowerPoint Live, that is rendering my slide deck in frame inside the Teams client. And it's actually using the viewer that we use for the web apps in Office on, excuse me, in the Microsoft 365 online apps. Um, we just rolled out Excel Live, which works the same way. It takes an Excel worksheet, drops it in frame inside the Teams client, lets us all collaborate together as if we were co-authoring inside of Microsoft Excel. What Cameo does, is um, you have to build this inside a PowerPoint online or, or on the PowerPoint desktop. You go to insert cameo. It's going to be all the way over on the right hand side. And it essentially puts in the camera feed that Teams is using. So whatever your camera is set to underneath devices inside of Microsoft Teams, it takes a window of that camera feed and just drops it right onto the slide. So because it's an object in PowerPoint, you can put text over the top of it. You can resize it. If you use transitions, you might've noticed mine even slid around a little bit. So when I have that executive that says, you know, I wanna have just a really killer experience with this thing. Um, Nick, I want you to do professional production to make it look really cool. I'm first gonna say, could we just use PowerPoint Live and use this feature that lets me put you on slides? right next to your content. That's a built-in thing supported by Microsoft. I don't have to go get some extra piece of gear and add a moving part. And it's something that you or your team can easily do with just out of the box end user features. So if I've got up to a thousand people, I've got a lot of capabilities inside of just the basic teams meetings that allows me to manage that. Steal this slide if you like, make changes to it. I always encourage my users have a standard housekeeping slide because that will let the rest of your attendees know how you're going to interact. And then finally, one little uh, just tool here, you're also welcome to steal. Um, Don, I'll make sure we kind of block this out separately. But this is a one pager I put together on everything I just showed you. So when I'm working with my users, I have a few I support directly and a couple of nonprofits. This is what I give them. It just has screenshots and some recommendations and the meeting options go in and do that and then these are the same links out to the help file that i referenced earlier and then you'll have guardrails set up for your very large teams meeting teams meetings scale up to a thousand people 
You don't need to touch live events or that fancy production stuff. With these settings, PowerPoint Live, Cameo, you can do a pretty professional session just right out of the box. Um, it'll even run on a on a you know slower computer. You won't have to have some some massive graphics card. So we'll post all those. So you've got them. Um, let me finish up with uh, three screenshots of Teams Premium, then we'll jump out to the admin center and see where a couple of these settings are. So everything I just showed you is included in Microsoft Teams. For this next part, I need a Teams Premium license to use it. The first is something called meeting templates. A meeting template is something that the Teams admin sets up in the, in the Teams admin center, and you assign it with a meeting template policy. You will not see the settings for this unless you've enabled the Teams Premium trial or you have at least one user in your tenant that's licensed for Teams Premium. It allows you to go in and take those meeting option settings, pre-configure them and save them as a template. And you can give it a friendly name like all hands or executive call. And so maybe in my executive call template, we always start off with a limited number of people who can present. Attendee microphone and camera are turned off, but Q&A is turned on and reactions are turned on. Maybe that's how we do all of our, every time a vice president does an all hands, that's what we set up for them. And then if an executive admin or someone in that group or the vice president herself goes in and schedules the meeting, she can pick a template as an option when she goes to the upper right in the team's calendar and picks meeting type. And that gives me all those options pre-confined. It'll open up the meeting details and all those settings are already in place. So that's a nice way that as an admin, we can put some guardrails up around our users. The other thing I can do as an admin is go in and create a customization policy. And this allows me to create a policy for Teams meetings that changes the branding, the background that's used in the lobby join experience and the meeting experience, and even the logo that's applied uh, up at the top. I think it's got the regular Microsoft logo. You can even pick a hex code that exactly matches your color of whatever it is that you're you're scheduling. So it just gives me a really nice, exper uh, really nice consistent experience, especially useful if someone's coming in from outside the organization. The virtual green room, so this is a screenshot of a Teams meeting. I've got two presenters that are in here. And if I zoom in up toward the top, you'll see a little button that says start meeting. What happens is it allows the attendees to join, but keeps them in a lobby. They can actually chat, so you can make announcements like, hey, we're gonna start in one minute. But it allows me to have a huddle with my talent, with my event team, we can see each other, we can share our desktops, only we can see that until I click start meeting, then it turns it on for everybody else and they can see it. So this is a really nice um, sort of you know, T minus three minutes, let's do a final sound check, make sure we're all on camera. Nick, you got spinach in your teeth. You know, do those kind of corrections before we go in, then I click start meeting, and then the content then hydrates in for everyone so they're able to see it. For all the ones that we've just seen, only the person who schedules the meeting has to have the Teams Premium license. So in general, for these meeting capabilities for Teams Premium, we've tried to make it so it's the meeting organizer that has to be licensed, and then attendees and presenters, as long as they're in the meeting where the organizer set it up, those capabilities will, turn, will be turned on just for that meeting. So I've got a slide with a table here toward the end that kind of lists all those and the license that we that's re required for each, each of it. Let's see, Jason asks, how soon can we chat in a meeting if the sponsor has Teams, but the user doesn't have a Teams license and is not a guest user in the sponsor tenant? As long as they're, as external attendees are allowed to join meetings, they would be able to come in, Jason, turn that on and, and be able to chat. That is a meeting policy. Sorry, we've now talked about three places at the admin center. That's a meeting policy setting that the team's admin enables is whether or not do I allow external users or anonymous users that aren't licensed for teams to participate. Let's see, Edward's asking about green room. That's probably a good segue. Let's jump out and take a look at a couple of these things. So let me. Let me flip over. Let's look at those admin policy settings, and then we'll see what this green room thing looks like. Uh, oh yeah, Tamara, good point. Um, everything we just talked about there for the like the uh, the capabilities for uh, letting people in with the green room is assuming it's a private meeting. 
channel meetings allow whoever's in the channel is considered a presenter and they can come right in and do stuff. So um, channel meetings are, you know, the, if you think about when Microsoft made Teams, it was originally a competitor against Slack and channels are meant for groups of people that are collaborating together for events. Even if you're doing all hands and everyone's in the channel, I would still actually do it as a private meeting. So let me say that again. Let's say I've got a team in Microsoft Teams called North American Employees, and it's got 700 people in it. And we decide we're going to do a North American all hands. I would not do that as a channel meeting. The reason is it becomes very difficult to bring any outside uh, presenters, even someone who's not external to the organization, into that channel meeting. They've got to join the team and get access to the channel. You wind up with that issue of accidentally getting multiple meetings started at the same time inside the channel with the, the channel meet now. And I would argue that could be exasperated the more people are trying to get, trying to start, especially like with an all hands. And then there's a few of these controls that require a private meeting in place uh, for it to be able in there. OK, let's go take a look at a couple of these. So the first thing I mentioned was a meeting template. So I'm logged into a demo environment as an admin. And to make a meeting template, so I've got Teams Premium licensed somewhere inside of this environment. At least one user has it, so that then hydrates in this setting. Otherwise, we don't see it. I'm going to click Add. And I'm going to give it a name. Um, so let's, let's use the one I called earlier, a VP All Hands. So anyone in our company, vice president or below, event or VP and below, one to many town halls, or whatever I want to call it. Uh, if the CEO is doing something, she gets the, she actually does have access to the production team, uh, or at least at that point as the admin, I wouldn't even know about it. But this one, I'm going to set it up so like any VPs, exec admin, or the VP themselves can go in and schedule it. Then I go through here and just adjust settings. Um, so let's say who can bypass the lobby. Um, let's say um, only invited users, only the people that are on the invite as a speaker can come in. Nobody with a phone can get in or out of the lobby. We scroll down a little bit farther. Um, do I want to enable watermark? Sure. That's often a confidential thing that comes up. That puts the viewer's email over like their actual uh, the text of their email itself over the any video or any webcam that's being shared. So if I had this turned on right now on my screen, I would see Nick ST at Microsoft.com kind of patterned across the screen. So if I was trying to screenshot what Kim was doing earlier, maybe I want to post it on Twitter. Uh, when I did that screenshot, it would be clearly marked and stamped with my email. It would really help prevent accidental or on purpose leaks uh, coming out. Let's see, with these big events now, we're going to have everyone be muted by default. So I'm going to turn off attendee microphone and camera, and I don't want to have meetings recorded automatically. I want to be able to come in and click that record button just in case we start a little bit earlier. Uh, I don't want to have attendees when they uh, join and leave. I don't want to be there. Allow meeting chat. Uh, I'm going to say it's on only during the meeting. And what this means is people can't go into their calendar, open up the meeting, click the chat tab and type something without me letting them into the meeting and actually seeing them in there and do it. It'll also prevent those those notifications. You ever get these for like you get notifications for a, a meeting that you've never even accepted. Well, that's what's going on. It's popping up. The, the meeting chat is popping up. Let's see. We will use the Q&A and we're going to manage what people see. And I'll explain what that looks like in a minute. OK, great. I'm going to go ahead and save that. So that was step one. I made my template. Step two is I go just underneath that to meeting template policies. And I apply my template policy. So what I can do is go in and add another one. I would select which of the meeting templates are available. I would then apply that to a user or a group, and then those people would have access to that policy. So at this point, it works just like policies do um, elsewhere inside of Microsoft Teams. So th that's how the meeting template capability works. The other policy that I referenced earlier is customization. So this allows me to add branding. Uh, so let's call this our external meeting branding. And I'm essentially going to create a policy that changes sort of the default purples that Microsoft uses for everything. Uh, I uh, work for the fictional company Contoso, which a lot of Microsoft people work for when they're doing demos. So I'm going to upload the Contoso logo. Uh, I want to upload 
a background image that will appear in the meeting join lobby. Uh, I can go in and put it, pick a color, or put in the hex code or the RGB code that I want. And then if we preview it, there we go. That's what it's going to look like now if you join a meeting that has this policy assigned to it. Great, so that's a beautiful looking theme. That looks pretty good. Let's go ahead and apply it. And now, just like you saw me do earlier, this is a policy that's being set. So I would then go in and assign a user or a Microsoft 365 group to this, go ahead and save. And now when they go and schedule a meeting, it'll look like this with that policy assigned to it. So be careful. Uh, I've seen a tendency of people wanting to do a lot of these. Hey, like let's have this type of branding for this product line and this type of branding for that product line. Don't do it. Um, remember the fable of the Windows group policy. Uh, Microsoft introduced group policy 25 years ago, and some people went out and said, hey, we're going we're gonna, to um, kind of profile our entire company, our entire organization, <laughs> every user, every role where they are. We're going to have a customer. We're going to customize every setting. And for some reason, our computers now take 15 minutes to boot. All right, so I always want to use the defaults if I can. Anything that I go through and tweak and change, I'm, I'm then going to responsible for maintaining that tweak or change and and that can be a very very frustrating experience so those were those those two policies set from an admin perspective um, that are enabled underneath teams premium let's look at this managed mode and this um, virtual green room thing so uh, let's see if this works i started a meeting earlier i'm signed in as this user megan let's resume that should take us back in as the presenter great there we go all right, and so what I what I did before we got here is I went in and scheduled a meeting. Underneath the meeting options, I flipped the little toggle that says use green room, and I flipped the little toggle that says manage what attendees can see. Let me show you what both of these look like. So here I'm I'm in a meeting right now. This you can see down at the bottom that's actually me, and then I've just got a couple of looping webcams. Uh, kind of a best practice when I'm in boring meetings or conference calls, I loop a webcam on myself. The key is to make small motions and occasionally nod with an understanding expression and hope your boss doesn't ask you a question while you're out mowing the lawn or something. So here, this is a meeting. Uh, my presenters are in the meeting talking to each other. I'm using control what people can see. And so they're all off to the side. And then I've got another user. Let's go find it here. That is logged in as there we go. This is an attendee in the same meeting. And so the, the, the meeting hasn't started. They're just kind of sitting in the meeting lobby. What I'm going to do is flip back over to the meeting where I'm going to present her and I'm going to click start meeting. So I've already talked to everyone. I made sure I can see them. We've brought up our content. Let's go ahead and click start. It says, are you sure? I'll say yes. It's going to fire it up. And then for myself, the co-organizers, the presenters, the rest of the event team, uh, those little yellow buttons appear, but otherwise it kind of looks the same. But if I flip over to my attendee now, now the meeting has started. And so they're brought in and they're now hearing things and they're they're participating with it. So that's what the green room is. It's it's not a separate meeting. All it does is it kind of hides the audio shared content and webcams that the presenters are using from the attendees until I click start. It also did nothing with the recording. So I'll just kind of let the person into the meeting so they can see it. I've still got to go here and then record the meeting. So it's not like a live event where when you click start, it, it automatically starts recording. Let's go back and look at the attendee view again quick. And you'll notice even though I've got three presenters in the meeting, they all have their webcams on, the attendee doesn't see any of them. That's the second Teams Premium feature called uh, manage what attendees can see. What I can do, oh, let me hover off off of that is you click on the little three dots next to someone and say bring on screen and it pulls them over and drops them onto the screen so if i want to have nestor talking to the slide i can bring him on screen and now my attendee sees that user next to the content if i want to bring myself on screen let's say this person is also going to speak to the slides so we've got both of them together but we're going to keep patty off until we're ready for her part and so the attendee sees both those people. And what I really like about this is if we um, if like if we stop our sh uh, sharing. So here, let's, let's take control of that PowerPoint live and turn off sharing. 
I still have my two people on the screen. It puts us right next to each other and doesn't put any of the other speakers up. If you look at our meeting that we're in right here, the, the Minnesota Microsoft 365 um, user group meeting, like up at the top, you'll see the little placeholders for like Don and Kim, you know, the people who talked recently, unless you've clicked the view button and chosen um, only show content. This allows me to have that side by side panel discussion that people often want to have, especially if they're doing an internal town hall. That, that's how I do that. So, uh, but then when I'm ready to bring Patty in, you know, let's bring her on screen. Let's take Nick off screen. Notice it's trying to just dynamically figure out where to put people. And you'll also notice if I'm using this feature that I'm kind of looking really, really close, that's the same icon as Spotlight. So I'm not able to spotlight one person. Essentially, I'm just bringing on whoever I want to, and it's it's spotlighting them uh, to, bring, to bring them in. So if I'm using Teams Premium, again, I don't need that for everybody. Of, of course, all your Microsoft people on the phone would love for everyone to buy it for everyone. Uh, but what you might consider is, hey, if you're an event organizer, this is a license we might enable for you if you've got a business case. Keeping in mind, you're going to have to show them a couple of these advanced features. And so you might want to have some type of gating to that process. Maybe they've got to take a test or join a community or have peer support just so you're not taking a lot of help desk calls on, hey, how do I just bring the two people on? You know, we want to kind of enable people and also train them in parallel um, as we go through this. While I'm in here, sorry, go ahead. Was there a question? Sorry, Michelle, I thought I heard you for a second. All right, so anyway, that, that's what those two capabilities are. Um, while I'm in here, let's take a look then at webinars. And we can also see how that is going to work both out of the box and then some additional capabilities I have. So if I click my little drop down up here at the top, these are where my meeting templates sit. And by default, I've got a couple just kind of built into Teams, the virtual appointment, live meeting, excuse me, virtual appointment, live event, a regular meeting, and a webinar. The one you saw me create earlier, it'll show up here probably another 30 minutes or so. So it seems to take about an hour uh, for those policies to kind of propagate and show up in all of the UIs uh, across the tenant. A webinar, as I mentioned, is just it's a Teams meeting, but with registration. The way that I think of this is in a regular Teams meeting, when I schedule it, I send you an invite. You get a calendar invitation coming over that you can then accept and then joins the meeting. With a webinar, it's a little bit different. This is something I want to track who's going to attend this thing. So let's call this Contoso Marketing Event. I'll put in a description for it. So product intro. I'm in Minnesota, so we can put in some Swedish text. Joke never gets old. Uh, I want to put in who's going to be my presenters here. So I'll put in maybe one of my user is a presenter. I always like to have at least one person as my co-organizer. Where does this live inside of Microsoft 365? It's in my Exchange Online mailbox. I'm the organizer, the person who's scheduling it. I'm going to come back to that in a second and stress that one more time. Uh, this is going to be public. Great. OK, that looks good. I'm going to go ahead and save it. So that now creates the object in my Exchange Online mailbox. And as soon as I do that, these other tabs over here hydrate in so I can then begin to add some things. So for example, if I wanted to edit my information here for Megan, I can put in things like her company, her LinkedIn profile. I can add a picture for her. I can add a short bio. Uh, Megan can lift between 10 and 15% of her own body weight. Great. Good trivia to add for her. Go ahead and save it. I also have a little bit of control over the theming, not a ton, uh, but I can do things just like we saw when we do earlier with the um, with the meeting theming. I can go in and like upload a graphic, save that as the header background. Perfect, that looks good. I can change the logo and the color a little bit. It looks all right. And then under registration, now I'm going to see a couple of Teams Premium features show up here. You don't have to have Teams Premium to use webinar, but there are a couple extra things you get. In a basic webinar without Teams Premium, I can go in and limit the capacity on how many people can attend it. So maybe I'm nervous about having a great big webinar. I only want 100 people to come. If more attempt to, I could schedule another one. With Teams Premium, I can say I also want to approve everyone as they register. 
I want to have a wait list. So if more than 100 people register, it'll keep track of a wait list. You can automatically add them. You can also download it as an Excel file. And I want to limit the date. Let's say I want to go live with my registration now, and I want registration to stop. Oh, I goofed up something. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Missed an important step. Uh, <laughs> when I scheduled my webinar, I made it for today. I was like, that's kind of weird. Why are all those settings grayed out? Uh, let's make that. Let's make it the 19th, a red letter day, the date of our next Minnesota Microsoft 365 user group workshop. And now I can say, since that webinar is on the 19th, I'm going to turn on registration next Monday, and I'm going to turn it off next Thursday at maybe 5 p.m. Central. So let's look at my time for it. And I'd also like to capture some additional information. I'd like to get the job title for the person who registers. I'd like that to be required. I want to add a custom field. Let's grab a text field and say LinkedIn profile URL. And I'll make that optional. Great, that looks pretty good. We'll go ahead and save those. And then as I'm working, if I click draft, so what's happening is under the covers, Teams is building a very simple web page. Um, and so it'll uh, open, oh, we'll go to there in a second. Let's see if we can see it. So there's the draft of my page. You can see it's trying to put in like my profile information. If I click register, it'll pop up those questions that we saw. And it opens a team study. And then I could continue working through. Then finally, as people register, they'll show up in a registration report. To get that, I've got to say publish. That'll go ahead and make this live. And then that is the link I'm going to copy and send it out to people. So let's go open up a private browsing window and drop it in. And so now there's my webinar. My registration button's grayed out. What's going on? Oh, it doesn't open up until next Monday. And then people can go in and register. So that's uh, the webinar capability in Teams. Once what happens is once people register, they'll get an invitation to join the webinar. They'll get an ICS file that's sent to them so they can add it to their calendar. And at that point, the webinar is just a Teams meeting. It's just a regular old Teams meeting that they could use. If I wanted to add this someplace, look, let's say this was something internal. I'm tracking training. And so I want to, yeah, uh, Pete brings up a good question. I want to put it in SharePoint or something like that. Um, the page that I get is just a, it's just a regular um, XML based page. I'd have to use like an iframe or something and drop that uh, onto SharePoint so I could render it that way. Um, we don't have a way to um, like easily integrate this into SharePoint as like a registration web part. Um, it is dynamic. You know, so if I made it like 30% of the width of the page or something like that, um, it'll resize itself so it'll fit okay inside of SharePoint. But Pete, that's how I'd have to do that. It's just just bring it in or just just grab the link to it and drop that into SharePoint with a button in front of it saying click here to register, something like that. Anyway, that's how I can do with uh, the webinar piece. For now, I can take questions after, so I'll stay on in chat while we're doing the drawings and things like that. Uh, because we aren't really changing anything with live events, I'm not going to cover that in any detail right now. Teams live events work right now and will work just like they have for the last five years. The biggest difference that we added is the encoder capability for a live event. I'll show you where that is, but I'm not going to launch the live event and demo it. So I'm going to go in and create a new live event. So now I remember live events can go up to 10,000 people all the way up to 20,000 between now and the end of June. Uh, we raised that limit for the pandemic and every six months we keep it at 20,000, but I haven't seen anything that has confirmed that going forward, but I think it'll probably stay pretty high. And you can actually, Microsoft will temporarily bump that up for you. So if you need to do a live event for 100,000 people, we can do that. We just need to know a couple of weeks in advance and I'll bring up the link at the end on, on where you can do that. So let's say I've got my Contoso Town Hall. Go ahead and click next. And instead of doing it in Microsoft Teams, I'm going to do it with Teams Encoder. That is the button that I click that says, hey, I'm going to use my production environment, not the Teams client, to make this live event. Otherwise, it works the same. I get a link that I'm going to send out to attendees. There is an embed code I can grab. So if you're a stream person and you're like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? We can't have our live events in stream. We always had a landing page for the live event on the corporate comms website. They really like that. You can still do that. 
what you're going to do is just copy the HTML embed code. You'll get an iframe player for the live event. You'll drop that into SharePoint or Sitecore, whatever tool you're using, um, and then it'll render it as a player, just as if you grab like an embedded YouTube video and dropped it in. The one thing that's different is if we zoom in here, we get an RTMP, a real-time media protocol link. Let's just copy this so we can see what it looks like. Open that up in Notepad. This is very common across streaming in the internet. That is the ingest URL to my live event. That's where I'm going to send my content to from my introduction environment. So that's something we're going to see. Uh, let's see, Don, Michelle, I'm watching time. I'll probably go about eight more minutes. Just uh, I am me privately if you want me to go faster. Um, that is what we're going to continue to see is this ability to do streaming added to Microsoft Teams, both going into Teams and coming out. But let's take a look at this. I want to kind of level set on this whole RTMP thing. That, that's what we're going to wrap up with. Um, if I go back into Teams, let's go to my, uh, my meeting that's going on right now. Great, it's all it's all working really well. I want to send this somewhere else. Maybe this is a public announcement. I'm going to go under apps. And I'm going to add our custom streaming app to this meeting. You can see I practiced this earlier, so it's right there at the top. But this is where I go to add it. The other app that I can add is, that does something very similar. Uh, Facebook has one that's just for them is the Facebook Live app. These both look exactly the same. I'm going to do. Microsoft's inbox custom app. So I'm going to go ahead and click that and click add. And you can think of this as almost like it's adding like an extra, like, like an ingest. It's going to start pulling the webcam and any shared screen content out of the meeting and sending it someplace else. Uh, let's see, that looks good. I'm going to go ahead and click save. Our meeting is going to kind of continue here in the background. We'll let our people just keep talking and looping. And team says, OK, I need your I need this key. I need to know where to send this media stream. So I'm going to jump over to so I can find it here. What did I do with it? Too many windows open. Oh, my sign is that user. So I don't do it. Yeah. OK, hold on. I'm going to mumble to myself for a minute while I find it. The kids are used to dad doing this. OK, here I'm in in YouTube and I'm going to send this meeting over to YouTube live. So I'm going to. Go into YouTube and say I want to create a YouTube live broadcast, something a lot of streamers do. People half my age are making like five times my income doing that. I haven't cracked that nut yet. Maybe after today we will. And so what's happening is YouTube is saying, all right, Nick, we're going to make a spot for you to send your live content. Here is the stream key you're going to send your live content to. So I'm going to copy that and then go back over to our Teams meeting and paste it in. That's the URL. And then, I'm oh, sorry, I'm using the wrong terms. That's the URL, and then this is the um, key, which is just a little GUID for security to make sure not just anybody can stream to that. And I'm going to say start streaming. Now, my other attendees, anyone else who's in this meeting, just saw a little purple notification up at the top that says something like, this meeting is being broadcast. So they get a very simple alert that says, hey, one of the presenters is grabbing this content and sending it live someplace else. Uh, now, in the back end, the Teams service is talking to the YouTube service, and YouTube's in jest. There's a, you know, going across the internet in the middle as it goes. If we minimize Teams and go back to YouTube, see that guy spinning right there. So what's happened is the meeting has, uh, RTMP has sent like a handshake call out to it to say, hey, I've got some packets to send you. Now it's starting to send those packets uh, over to the meeting. Here it is coming live, and in a second we'll see the people pop up. There they are. And now, uh, now I'm inside of the YouTube ecosystem, so I could go ahead and turn it on. I can give out the YouTube link. Uh, if I've got comments enabled, they'd be live on the video. That's how I stream out of a Teams meeting to someplace else. With Teams Premium, I can also stream in. This is my last thing, guys, that we'll show. So here, I'm going to go out to another meeting that I've got going. Is that this one that I want? Uh, no, it's this one. Here it is. Remember earlier I said, well, you know, what if I've got like my professional production crew and they all went to like a two year college for media production and they just scoff at my webcams. Uh, you know, they, they've got lighting and sound and drones to fly around that they want to use all of that. Well, what I can do here is underneath meeting options when I schedule my meeting. 
one of the options that I have with Teams Premium is I can say, go ahead and enable RTMPN. So that's a little, little button that I hit earlier. And I get the same thing. So this real-time media protocol works the same way, whether you're coming or going. What you do is you get a link. So this is now, this is the ingest link for this Teams meeting. And I need to go to my production environment. So here I've got a bit of software running called OBS Studio. I could also use an encoder, a piece of hardware to do the same thing. OBS Studio is very popular in the streaming community. And I'm going to tell it, all right. Oh, wait, nope, I'm going to do something first. I'm going to stop streaming. <laughs> then I'm going to go into settings. And I'm going to tell it, okay, that's where I want you to send the stream to. That's the key that you're going to use. And so what I'm doing is just like you saw me do a second ago where I copied from YouTube and paste YouTube and pasted it into into Teams. I'm now going to Teams, copying the ingest point, pasting it into this other tool. And now I'm going to say start streaming. And the way OBS works, you don't need to know this, this is specific to this app, just as an example, is you compose scenes. You can bring in and drop, like here, I've dropped a, a graphic in. And so it's actually, that's just an image, like a bumper slide, but it's actually streaming that over to my meeting. So rather than a shared content, if you look, what's showing up in the meeting is this media stream coming from this other source. I'm going to advance my scene and start playing this video, which I think is a keynote of Satya Nadella. And if I minimize that, and oh, I've lost my place and go back over to my meeting and minimize all my thumbnails. So go away, team's thumbnails. Oh my gosh, I'm losing control of the thing. There it is. So there, that's coming over. And look, I got my little placeholder there. What I probably want to do so this looks like is maybe, you know, turn on focus on content or full screen. But this is actually coming now from my production environment. So if I had a studio someplace, they probably got like a production board. Maybe it's a new tech TriCaster or Blackmagic device. It's hooked up to all their cameras. It's pulling it in and it's pushing it across. Uh, that's how I would produce and, and send it in, uh, push it into Teams. Hey, Don, can I go two more minutes and show NDI? Do we have enough time? Yeah, I think we're good. OK, all right. All right. I said this is the last thing, but I'm having so much fun. I want to show you one more if you're still on. So everything I've done here has been, for the most part, out of the box with Teams, except for this last thing where I used a special piece of software to produce my content. I'm playing videos. This could be hooked up. What, what I do is I, I go in and I say, OK, here's all these other sources that I have, videos or images. Maybe I, I want to create a lower thirds. Uh, that's where you have like that graphic across the bottom uh, with like my name and title and things like that on it. Well, inside of Microsoft Teams, let's jump back over here to Teams. Under settings, this is a policy. So this is a setting underneath meeting policy in the admin center. You can go in and enable as an individual user something called a network device interface or NDI. Um, this is a licensed protocol from a company called NewTek. If you think about an old school television studio where you've got cameras with like wires running all over the place and those plug into a control deck, you know, think like a control room somewhere um, inside of a TV show. Um, those are plugged in legacy uh, with something called SDI or serial device interface. Well, the problem is you get cables all over the place and, and think of some place like 30 Rockefeller Center where where NBC is located. Imagine they want to run these cables up and down the building to different studios. It's really difficult to do. So NDI or network device interface that runs it over a computer network. And it's really handy. Most modern production environments have this. Well, if I enable that for Microsoft Teams, and then I go into my Teams meeting, let's resume this one that we had earlier. What you can do inside of a Microsoft Teams meeting is go under settings and turn on broadcast over NDI. And that uses your instance of Microsoft Teams to extract the media and audio that's inside of that meeting and send it out over your local area network. It's a really important point there, local area network or LAN. NDI is a non-routable protocol. So you've got to be on the same subnet. Uh, usually this is done inside of a studio that's in the same building. Then if I've got a production environment here, let's flip 
I've got an example like this already set. So here I've got an environment where what I'm doing is I'm listening on the network for NDI content that's coming over. Teams is grabbing the individual users' webcams as well as the shared video content from that meeting, sending it out to my LAN, and this device is then able to grab that and drop it into a scene. So I'm going to go in and say, yeah, just go ahead and show me that one webcam. Let's grab Grady's and drop it onto our screen. And there's my user coming in from this Teams meeting. And I could compose this. So I could grab, let's grab another webcam. Grab uh, Joanna's and drop it in. I can crop and resize this. So like Gordon Ramsay, I've got this already baked. So I can compose a scene that looks like that, that's pulling in the shared slide, the users, or I could do like a panel discussion. So now I'm using, I've got my presenters joining Microsoft Teams. I am special, I'm a power user, yeah, I'm a producer. Uh, I've got uh, a computer running Microsoft Teams and it's joined to that meeting and it's broadcasting their content out. My device, which in this case is this piece of software, OBS Studio, is picking it up and letting me compose exactly what I want. And then from here, I can stream it out somewhere else, maybe to YouTube or out to a live event or even another Teams meeting if I want to. That's about as advanced as I can get. And that allows me to do just really amazing things inside of Microsoft Teams with a Teams event. This is not something you want to directly support unless you're like into this space. This gets pretty advanced. I want a user who knows what they're doing here. This can't go to standard help desk just because you can see you start having a lot of moving parts. So if your VP of sales comes to you and says, hey, I want to do one of these really cool produce things with like lights and fog machine, you need to ask, okay, what's my budget? How much time do I have? If they say it's just you, tell them, hey, you know, that's just not possible. It requires a lot. Instead, I want you to use this PowerPoint cameo thing that I saw, and we'll just do this as a Teams meeting or as a live event. But if you do want to go deeper with this, and so um, Don, I'll start pulling this together while you're doing the drawings. Um, we do have a playbook that goes into detail. It's about a 60 page PDF that goes through how to do that advanced production. And the nice thing about this is any soft skills you learn here, they're going to be applicable to Teams, to Zoom events, to WebEx. Um, all those platforms work the same way with this RTMP ingest and how we pull it in. But let me go back. Let's finish up with my opening slide. That is the state of events inside of Microsoft Teams. I've got, oh, Nick, jumped to the wrong slide. I've got my Teams meetings which I want to use for just almost every use case if I can. They're the easiest to do. They scale up to 1,000 people. I put options in place and that controls them. A webinar is just a meeting with registration. If you've got a Teams premium license, the organizer does, they get that virtual green room that bring things onto screen, a little bit more control over the attendee view and templates to kind of put guardrails up and put it all together. Teams premium also gives me a little bit more control over registration. I can manually approve people, waitlist them and, and send out reminders. Live events work the way they always have. Stream live events are going away to be replaced with Teams encoder live events that allows me to watch a live event in the Teams client or on an embedded HTML web part somewhere. And I can push content to that from a production environment using RTMP. I can also stream a Teams meeting somewhere else, like to YouTube or a public place or another RTP ingest, and I can pull the media out of a Teams meeting, letting my talent, letting my executives join a meeting like they always do, but in the back, I can compose and make it look nothing like a Teams meeting. They don't need to know anything else that I'm doing, and I get that full layout control where I can use all my fancy gear and make it look nice. If I have Teams Premium, I can even RTMP in to a Teams meeting or webinar from that fancy environment. Otherwise, with regular teams, I can do it just with a live event. Whew, that is the state of events in Microsoft Teams today, Ooh. May 8th, 2023. <laughs> Fantastic. Nice job, As right. always, Nick, we love you. Thanks for.